Welcome to the Skip and Shannon Undisputed Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. You can catch us Monday through Friday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 Pacific on FS1. Here's what this podcast is all about. It's an unscripted, unfiltered, undisputed version of the day's show, and there is a lot to get into in today's podcast. Skip believes the Tony Romo saga in Dallas is the most intriguing story in sports. Off of Russell Westbrook's 57 points and yet another triple-double, Fox Sports NBA analyst Chris Broussard tells you why he's giving Russ the MVP, and Skip agrees. Two Hall of Famers Chris Carter and Shannon both break down the Richard Sherman drama in Seattle, and if the outspoken defensive back has crossed the line. Fox Sports College football analyst Joel Klatt joins us to talk about Joe Mixon and why NFL owners are staying away. Plus, we bring in no other but Mr. No Way, No How Rob Parker to get his reaction to Lonzo and LeVar Ball. I know you guys don't want to talk about the Heat, so how about the Spurs? How the Spurs do, Larry? I, I will. Uh, I'll make a deal with you. I am happy to talk about my Dallas Cowboys today if I don't have to talk about my San Antonio Spurs. Oh no! Is that a oh deal? no! No oh, deal. Good. No, I don't okay. deal. I don't deal with you anymore. They you know started what? strong. <laughs> <laughs> started strong. I, I, I was think, just trying to make you feel better. I, I think Golden State <laughs> did that on purpose just so they could rub they it could in. Make it worse. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I can assure you today. <laughs> If that had been the Cleveland Cavaliers, get out to a 23-3 lead and then end up losing by 12? But how much worse does last night make what happened to your Cavaliers in San Antonio two nights ago look? Boom. Look, look good. Yeah, yeah, it was mm. great. How's that Kawhi Leonard three-point shooting going? <laughs> Russell Westbrook had his 38th triple-double of the season last night in a comeback win against the Magic. Westbrook scored 57 points, including a game-tying three-pointer in the closing seconds of regulation to send the game into overtime. Westbrook had the most points in a triple-double in NBA history. Take a listen to Russ after the game. This was the biggest comeback in Oklahoma City franchise history. What did it take, particularly on the defensive end, for you all to do this down the stretch? Uh, grit, man. We needed everything, man. We got some stops when we needed, two stops on the mass, made some big shots down the stretch. So it was a huge win for us. Russ, you guys clinched the playoffs tonight. What's the mentality that you all need to have heading into this final stretch before it all happens? It's constantly keep getting better. Take one game at a time. You know, we started off a little sluggish tonight, and, you know, that's a good team, especially at home. And I thought we did a good job of making steps forward and uh, getting them out of the win. Congratulations, Russ. Thanks, Gala. That was Russell Westbrook scoring 57 last night in Orlando. We're joined now by Chris Broussard. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's great to be here. Did Russ win the MVP with his performance last night? I, I didn't need convincing. For the last three to four weeks, when it became evident, looked like he was going to average a triple-double, I've been with him, and they're winning at a pretty high pace. Um, but for all those, I think you're included in those. These are those. <laughs> who, yeah. who are struggling between Westbrook and Harden, and I can't imagine anybody else being in the race, I think last night should have done it. I mean, the highest point total in a triple-double ever then he does it in the clutch with the three-pointer to force overtime, which the last game against Dallas, he had 12 points in the last three minutes to come back from a 13-point deficit to beat the Mavericks. <clears throat> I want to say this to those who are questioning Westbrook and whether or not he should be the MVP, because for some reason this year, people are belittling a triple-double. They're downplaying a triple-double. There was even an article recently um, Jason McIntyre from Speak for Yourself, he, he's against Westbrook, so to speak. Um, but this article said Westbrook is not playing defense. He's leaving his man, and he's not contesting shots. And they had the statistical data to back it up. Like, he's, he's in the, the one Jordan of two or three players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has hardly contested any jump shots, Russell Westbrook. He's contested, like, three or four a game. Uh, and they're saying he's doing that, leaving his man to go get the rebounds. Okay, whatever the case, that may be true. Look, they're 31 and 7 when he gets a triple double. So if if it were hurting his team, they wouldn't be 31 and 7 as he gets these double figure rebounds. And you can't tell me he's the only player in the league now or in the league in history who's left his man a lot to get rebounds. A lot of big men do that and put up big rebounding numbers and they, their other guys block guys out. Okay, so if it's so easy, I hear the long rebounds now. Why isn't LeBron averaging a triple-double? Why isn't, you know, James Harden averaging a triple-double? Why hasn't anybody else done it if now, oh, it's not that big of a deal, it's easy? He is, we've, we've never seen a player put up numbers that rival 
Wilt Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson, no. what they did in their era. No. He's doing it. He's not only doing it, he's surpassing Oscar Robertson and is about to surpass him, I think, with more than 41 triple doubles. Mm -hmm. So how, I, I, to me, as great as Harden's been, I would gotta give it to Westbrook. A triple double, it's like hitting 400. You convinced? What good is 400 if you don't, if, 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 if I'm gonna give the MVP. Because think about it. You remember, uh, it was Mike Trout and it was Miggy Cabrera. Miggy had the triple crown. But a lot of people thought Mike Trout. It wasn't until Miggy got, I think they won the division on the last day. Yeah. And uh, he ended up winning the MVP. But people were looking like, but Mike Trout numbers are so impressive. He, you know, he still, how, how many runs that he saves. For me, if he gets to the fifth seed, I'm willing to concede it. How good should that team be? They're battling. They're, they're actually the same as the Clippers in the loss column. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're maxing out. They don't have a ton of great talent on that team. And Houston does? Houston doesn't have great talent either. I, I put a lot of this in Houston, taking nothing away from James Harden. But a lot of this is Mike D'Antoni. Like, James Harden is perfect for D'Antoni's right. system. Ryan Anderson. Uh, Gordon. Go Lou Eric Williams. Gordon. Lou, they, they're perfect for his yeah. system. Billy Donovan is a good coach, but he, he has not perfected a system for that team like D'Antoni has for Houston. So I think that's a big part of it. What happened You're right, he doesn't have great When D'Antoni coached the Phoenix Suns, somebody won back-to-back MVPs named Steve Nash. And right. you didn't love those, right? Well, I thought the first one, but I thought the second one, Shaq should have won the MVP that I would agree, time around. But he, he did in... win back-to-back -back yeah. MVPs in large part because he was in the very same no system question. that no. this guy is operating right. in. And I take nothing. I've said this a bunch of times. I'm going to say it again. I take nothing away from James Harden because he took it up to a level I did not see no. coming. But this level is unheard of. It's, it's extraordinary because... I told you, I'm not going to compare Russell Westbrook to Michael Jordan, but there's something Jordan-esque about the ability to play at this high of a level against this degree of difficulty because obviously he's not playing with Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman. Rodman. He's playing with Ennis Cantor coming off the bench. You know, it's, it's, th th that's his guy. That, that's who's Victor going Victor Oladipo yeah, is like right, <laughs> your right. second score. And, and I thought I told you earlier, but... I thought they'd added two nice pieces, Taj Gibson, Doug McDermott. And last night I look at the box and Taj plays 24 minutes and scores two points and gets four rebounds. And McDermott last night managed to play three minutes and 25 seconds and did not score. So they didn't help at all. Nobody really helped last night except for the guy who scored 57 points. It has become Russell or bust. True. And I was, I'll take last night and the previous game at Dallas, both of them, where you're coming back from impossible odds, where you're you're stuck, you're 14 down late in the Dallas game, five minutes left, and you then you score the last 16 points from that mark. You said 12, but from that point, you score the last 16, and you hit the game winner. Then you go to Orlando against a dangerous team, and I don't want to go through all the wins, but they've had a bunch of nice wins this yeah. year because if you're not ready for this team, and, and I also made the case, if you put Russell on the Magic, they're a better team than the Thunder are with talent. And they, then you could lift it up a whole nother level if you put Russell on that team. Look, if Oklahoma City was in the East, I, they wouldn't beat Cleveland, but I think they'd be as good as anybody else in the East. They'd be battling for the second seed. I don't think there's any question. Yeah, I mean, mostly their record isn't that much. We yeah, 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 because of Westbrook. But they're re I think they'd be better than Boston. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it yeah. out there. So they're down last night 22 late in the third quarter, and then they're down again 14 with 618 left, and Russell winds up scoring 19 in the fourth quarter alone. Last 601. And, and there you go. And, <laughs> and he hits a shot from eight feet beyond the three-point line, and he's not a great three-point shooter. And you can't tell me he just didn't will the ball in the basket. You know, sometimes you just yeah. say, I'm going to make this shot whether you like it or not. And you made the point, they're going to double him. They're going to yeah. trap him. Look but he guys. doesn't even get to the trap. He just says, I'm going to pull up, and I'm going to will this ball in that basket to tie the game to send it to overtime. This is extraordinary stuff, and he does it every night after night after night. But I do think he, he, these last two games, I think a lot of voters are going to look at what he's been able to do especially in the clutch. Because a lot of times you're like, yeah, he's taking all these shots, 
but these last two games, they've won because of him. And but for me, it's got winning has to mean something. They are winning. Winning by, by their standards. But James winning. Harden's got a better team and why? a better coach right now. Okay, he has a better coach, but why are they a better team? I mean, you because you got guys that fit that system perfectly. And Just like San Antonio, talent wise, you might not say they're the first or second or third best team in the league talent wise, but as a team, they fit better together. But here's the thing OKC built their team with bigs. He can dump the ball off and Adams and Cantor and Sabonis lay the ball in. Those are tougher threes than three t- tougher assists than three pointers. I agree. No, yeah, nobody I dunks told you that. nowadays you have to penetrate and create mm-hmm. for your big man. It's not like back in the day where you could just do a post entry feed. To Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. No, that's what I'm saying. But that's Russ is getting... You're not doing that with Steven Adams. No, I'm saying Russ can get down the lane against him. He's breaking down everybody getting down to the hole. That's difficult, but that's a skill. Like, when you can break somebody down, get to the hole, and then... Draw right, that's, traffic that's credit to and pass. What, what, yeah, that's, what about that's Harden? I mean, so what, Harden's great. I, I so was with ask, Harden for the first let me ask three, you four months of which the is, season. Which is harder to assist? A harder is, is a three-point shot or a layup or a dunk? It's harder to get the layup or dunk. If you're talking about a layup or dunk in transition, that's easier. But a th- I'd say in the half court, a three-point shot is an easier assist. I disagree. Mm. And so, remember, so it's easy to make it's easy to make a dunk or a layup than it is a three-point shot. Well, it's, it's a it's a you, higher difficulty pass, of I'm a shot about the from three pointer, no, but you saying, have to the move the ball around hard. and run a play to get a get a point inside. A get no. a shot inside. And Shannon, James remember. Harden. The Oklahoma City Thunder were built for Westbrook and Durant. That's what they yeah, were built for, yeah. not just for Russell and two bigs. What well, and that's why Look, another Harden, big. I don't want to take in like Skip. I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Harden because any other year he would be the clear cut MVP. But I think if we don't give it to a guy that's average of triple double, you know what? Let's stop celebrating triple double so much. Then next year when somebody gets a triple double, okay, nice. But listen, let's not make it a big deal. This guy is averaging a triple double, averaging one. Well, we need to stop celebrating winning then. He's winning. He's winning more than Harden. No, but his team okay. is winning. They're maxing out. Oh, so both teams are maxing out. They're thirty-one. Oh, so both teams they're, maxing out. If he was scoring triple doubles and they were losing in those games, then that would be Eight. that would make sense. Yes. They're thirty-one and seven. They're thirty-one and seven. So what was Oscar's record? Triple double. What was Oscar's record? Forty-three wins when he got a triple double. They played and that was games. a different era. That was when players were voting. Oscar, he, Oscar said a couple weeks ago he didn't even know he was getting triple doubles back then. Hmm. They didn't really. They it wasn't exist. celebrated. No. He actually averaged a triple double his first five seasons. No mercy. Hey guys, it's Joy Taylor. We have some more debates coming up. But first, Shannon wants to tell you about this great offer from T-Mobile. Opening day for Major League Baseball is just around the corner. And T-Mobile is giving away a free year of MLB TV premium so you can catch every game no matter where you are. Will the Cubs repeat? Will Bryce Harper regain his MVP form? Can the Indians snap the longest World Series drought with no titles? Here's what you need to do. Make T-Mobile your phone provider. Download the T-Mobile Tuesday app, and on April 4th, you'll get a free year of MLB TV premium. Some legal disclaimers here. The top 3% of data users may notice reduced speeds. Also, you must activate the HD feature, otherwise video typically streams at 480p. Web-enabled mobile devices and qualifying services required. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. Remember, April 4th, get your free year of MLB TV premium through the T-Mobile Tuesday app or go to T-Mobile.com slash MLB. Great, Shannon. Again, that's T-Mobile on April 4th. I know this is a great thing for someone like me who lives in L.A. to still be able to catch all the Marlins games. Blackouts and other restrictions apply. See terms of use for details. Now back to the show. No mercy. Jerry Jones originally said he would implement the, quote, do right rule when it comes to Tony Romo's status in Dallas. Yesterday, Jones said Romo's future is a top priority. Jerry said, I have his interest at the top of my list. How this thing evolves over the next few weeks or months will be dictated by what Tony wants to do. As we stand here talking about these circumstances, he has some of the best options you could have, but I think he can still win at a championship level. Texans owner Bob McNair was asked about the rumor that Romo could end up in Houston, and he said, Jerry saw the trade we made with Brock Osweiler. Jerry wants to make a trade. I understand that, but he's between a rock and a hard place with that. If Romo ends up anywhere and Dak doesn't play well, it won't look good. Skip, what do these comments tell you? Wow. 
You know, this story <laughs> is now becoming the best and most intriguing story in all of sports to me because the plot has thickened by the day. So now, thanks to my friend Jarrett Bell, USA Today, we have new quotes from both of the principals involved, the owner of the Cowboys and the owner of the Houston Texans. And I have two big takeaways on those quotes. Okay. First of all, I was shocked at what Bob McNair said to Jarrett Bell, said it publicly, because what he said, and I'll get, you just read it, but I'm gonna read it again. It was profoundly true, but also profoundly damaging if in fact Bob McNair's goal is to acquire somehow Tony Romo by, by a release or trade. Mm -hmm. And what Bob McNair said of Romo is, if he ends up anywhere and Dak doesn't play well, it won't look good. Boom. That, you, that cannot be more true because if Romo goes anywhere else, albeit Houston or Denver or the Jets or wherever else it is, Correct. and it won't even really matter how well Tony plays if Dak doesn't play well, Correct. it will make Jerry look foolish, number one, and trust me on this, it will haunt Jerry Jones the rest of his days because I think we agree on one point here. Jerry has never been quite sold on Dak Prescott. Not that he doesn't like Dak, but he doesn't love the way it all unfolded last year because you can make a case, and I will be objective enough, as much as I love Dak, to acknowledge a case can be made that Dak was somewhat a product of a great offensive line and a great rookie running back mm -hmm. and a defense that played way over its head all year long and was fifth in the NFL and points allowed. You can make that case that he overachieved and looked way better than he should as a fourth round draft choice and that going forward, he will experience a sophomore slump, if you will. He will look something like a one-hit wonder, one-year wonder. Right. Okay, that's not my take, but you can make that case, and, and I can't shoot it down until he proves all those people right. wrong a second year. So that was said by Bob McNair. That wasn't some media guy writing some scathing column about it. That will resonate with Jerry. Trust me that a rival owner who, who most people respect, around everybody respects Bob McNair around the league, he said it publicly, so it's going to stick in Jerry's craw like, yeah, God, what if Dak does struggle? What makes it more, Skip, is not a source. It's a not so a source. No, it's on the record. <laughs> yeah. He said it. Yeah. In the same article in which Jerry was the featured interview, yes. Bob McNair countered with that point, which undercuts McNair's chance of getting Tony Romo, which I think is the one Super Bowl piece away for them. So... Now you step back, and he concludes, Bob McNair, Jerry is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Okay? We, we get that. Mm -hmm. So now let's move to this. Even worse, Jerry says to Jarrett Bell in this USA Today story, Tony has some of the best options you could have. Well, I, I sort of alluded to this yesterday, but now it's been out there, so I'm going to go forward with it because it's been reported now. Yes that Tony Romo has been offered one of the plum jobs in all of sports broadcasting. Yes. The lead analyst for CBS in the booth alongside Jim Nance. How often does that job open up? Once every 20 years. 20 years. 25, what, 30 maybe? years. And I'm also told that Peyton Manning is in the running for that job, but that Peyton hasn't yet decided whether he wants to commit full-time to the broadcasting business just yet. Right but maybe he could be talked into it. So now the game of blink, the, the stare down, is going in different directions because pretty soon CBS is going to need to know. You'd know better than I would. How soon do they need to have an answer on this? Pretty um, soon? Yeah, because right? everything is predicated on if you're not going to get Romo, you're not going to get uh, Peyton Manning, you're going to have to sign Phil back. You, yeah, and I'm sure, it, uh, I'm sure this Phil's is a friend of mine, and I'm sure he's not real very, pleased about no. all this being out there. Because how long have you been in that spot? Well, I've 15 lost years? 15 years, because I worked with him and your brother at ESPN way back in the day. What year was that? God, that was like 93. And then he went right into CBS right after that. So it's Well, they, he called our game in 19... He There was a three-man booth then. They called our game in 1997 in the Super Bowl. Yep. So it's been at least 20 years 
he's been he's been a lead. Okay. So that just goes to and show. By you. the way, he's been great. Yes. Yes. But times change, life changes, and Tony Romo has a life changing decision to make. Can he walk away from football at age 37, having played five games over the last two years? And as you continue to point up day after day on the show, Tony, what do you have to show for it in your postseason resume? Mm -hmm. Not much, right. right? So if Tony has an opportunity to, to either go to Houston or go to Denver or I'm going to throw this out, stay in Dallas and take a shot at winning a Super Bowl, would that not enhance Tony Romo's resume. Is it, does it not look a little shaky right now? It looks like he just sort of fizzled out at the end and couldn't stay healthy. Am I right? Right. Okay, so now he has an opportunity that you can't turn down if, in fact, you want to be a broadcaster. You have to seize the day. Absolutely. Okay, because if you walk away from it, Peyton might not walk away, maybe not this year, but next year, and you might not get this opportunity again, right. although it's also reported this network watched Tony, so maybe there would be a great opportunity here for him also. But who knows? It's, it's up in the air. Concluding quote from Jerry Jones, he adds a but to that statement about Tony's options. But I think he can still win at a championship level. I have said this repeatedly. I believe it with all my heart and soul. Jerry is not just negotiating when he says that. He's not trying to leverage a draft choice from somebody else. I believe that in Jerry's heart of hearts, he believes Tony can still win a Super Bowl. If that's true, and I'm going to take that as a fact, why would you let go of a guy you think could win a Super Bowl? So I'm going to give up today, and here's what I'm going to say. I don't run the Dallas Cowboys. I'm a fan. I've been a fan for a long, long time, since 1961. But the buck stops with this guy, Jerry Jones. And if he truly believes that the answer is Tony Romo, you know what he should do, Shannon Sharp? He should start Tony Romo next year. Why wouldn't you? Why would you let him go to anybody else? Why would you risk looking foolish looking stupid if Dak does, in fact, struggle, why wouldn't you just go ahead and tell Dak, hey, I, I hate to tell you this, but you're going to have to be on the back burner for a while. You're our future, but Tony's our present. Why wouldn't you do that? If mm -hmm. you believe this, why wouldn't you just say, because can he not pull it off cap-wise? Sure he can. Sure. Dak makes, what is it, 500000 500, Okay. So you tell Dak, thank you very much for what you did last year. Just hold the phone and you're going to be okay because we don't know if Tony will last one game or two games or seven games. Or maybe he'll win the Super Bowl this year and retire. So, Dak, you're in a great spot. You've already proven you can do this at the highest level. You won 11 straight games for us. Why wouldn't Jerry Jones just say, heck with all of you. I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to start and play Tony Romo as long as he can stay healthy next year, and let's see if we can go win the Super Bowl that I believe he can go win. That's my takeaway from this piece. McNair dared him to do that, basically, mm -hmm. and I think Jerry, in the end, if that's what's in his heart, that's what he should do as the owner and operator of my Dallas Cowboys. Skip, it's, it's very, very simple. Powerful people are used to getting what they want. And Jerry wants to have his way. Now, Bob McNair really confirmed what I've been saying all along. He would have released Tony Romo had they not traded Brock Osweiler. That's what would have happened. Skip, there is no way whatsoever if Jerry Jones had not told Tony Romo he was going to be released, would Tony have made that Instagram post? You know that, I know that. Although J Jerry tried to finesse it by saying he, he used his favorite expression that he used to me all the time, ambiguity. Amb it's, it was ambiguous. It's, it, I, I meant that I would either trade him or release him, but go ahead. But there's no such thing, Skip, yeah. because here's the thing. If you had told Tony you were going to trade him, you would expect assets in return. Tony, would, Tony wouldn't have, Tony would, it would have been once the reports come out mm -hmm. that Tony Romo is going to be traded. He is traded. Now Tony makes that video. Tony makes that video the night before free agency is supposed to happen mm -hmm. that Thursday. He got, he got word from Jerry. Now, maybe Jerry's under the Floyd Mayweather. You know, when Floyd fights someone, he gets to release it on his social media page, mm -hmm. his Instagram, his Twitter, whatever. I, I, he I gets to release that. that. Yeah. So maybe Jerry's like, hold on, wait a minute. I was supposed to say this, not okay. you. Skip, it's, it's really simple. Jerry says, I have his interest at the top of my list. No. Nope. They are. 
but they're not Jerry's priority trumps that. So Jerry's priorities are higher on his list than Tony's priority. Because here's the thing. You just said that Jerry said Tony can still win a championship. But in the same article, he said it would not bother him if he went somewhere else. You and he was talking about Houston. You right, Skip. Stop. If you think that man can win a championship, because here's the thing, Skip, if you think he can win a championship for someone else, that's why you gave him that money. That's why you bet the farm on him, because yeah. you felt the very thing, same thing. He could win a championship for you. Because, see, here's what happens when you trade him. Not only do you get to trade the player, you get something back for him, yep. but you also get to control where he goes. Mm -hmm. See, if you release him, the do-right rule. Now, see, Jerry's kept saying this do-right rule. I'm going to release Tony. Tony, don't go to Washington. Okay, fine. Brock Osweiler get traded. Now, all of a sudden, the do-right rule is off the table. Tony, I need you to do right by me by retiring because mm -hmm. Jerry's going to do right by me, yep. which is what I want to do in the okay. meantime. Skip. He re Tony really doesn't have a whole lot of options. He's under contract with the Cowboys. The Cowboys have said if he retires, we won't ask for any of the money. That's what they want, Skip, all things being equal. Let's be 100% candid. All things being equal, Jerry Jones would really like for Tony to retire. He doesn't have to worry about him going anywhere else and winning a title. And guess what? He gets to have Dak. This is not a source that said Jerry is concerned about Dak mm -hmm. struggling in his second year. This is an owner. This is a partner, a managing partner, one yes. of 32. Said this is a, a, a concern of Jerry's. Yep. Not that Tony could go somewhere else and win. What about he goes somewhere else and Dak struggles? Correct. You remember when Mr. Ursay released Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck came in and was playing so well and he was taking all these shots at Peyton Manning. Yeah, we had these Star Wars numbers, but... I want more of these. Oh, he was just talking. He was. And then all of a sudden, Peyton wins an MVP. Peyton wins a Super Bowl. When last time you heard about, uh, uh, Mr. McNair, not Mr. McNair, Jim Ursay, mention anything about a Super Bowl? And by the way, that year, Andrew Luck had the second most turnovers in the league to butt from, I mean, to Mark Sanchez. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, Skip, but you remember he was, oh, 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 Peyton had great numbers. I'm disappointed we didn't yeah. get more Super Bowl rings out of right. this. I hadn't heard Mr. Ursay mention foot or ball or Super Bowl mm. because you realize how difficult those things are. Now, if Tony, Skip, I don't know what you're going to be able to do, Skip. If Tony Romo, let's just say for the sake of argument, Skip, he goes to the Houston Texans and he gets them, forget winning, gets them to a Super Bowl in the state of Texas. Jerry, Skip, what you going to do? You, you can't even risk it happening. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, you can't. And, and I, this dawned on me yesterday. In the history of the National Football League, when have you ever heard of an owner who believes he has a quarterback capable of winning a Super Bowl letting him go or trading him? No. What, what, who would do that? No. You, you just wouldn't do it, right? Tony's going to have because to weigh his options, Skip. It, it's not like you can trade Tony Romo for two first-round picks for no. a RG3 right, kind of haul. Right, right. Although, given Jerry's take on it, he deserves to at least get a first-rounder back, like a conditional first. Let, let Jerry if you think him. he can win a Super Bowl, that's what he sh you should get back. If this was Tony Romo at 27, you might have an argument. But Tony Romo at 37 with three shoulder surgeries and two back operations, that's not happening. But here's the thing for Tony Romo. Would you rather play one more year at 19 million with a possibility, chance to get to and win a Super Bowl, or would you ma rather make four to six million dollars over the next 15 to 20 years? Well, if you're a competitor, if if you've got, if you have that burning desire to be the best at what you do, because he's been close to the best a few times in his career, he just doesn't have anything to show for it in the postseason. Then you can't walk away. Skip. You can't take the four to six million. Here's the thing, though, Skip. There's no guarantee. When was the last time you saw a color guy lose his job? An analyst. Yeah, analyst, yeah. yeah. Right. I'm talking about. Uh, you, you talk about uh, Madden. You talk about Sims. You talk about uh, Aikman. You talk about all these top guys. When was the last time one lost his job? Unless you do something unforeseen, unthinkable. You're not losing that job. You're on that job for a minimum a decade. Mm -hmm. Maybe 15, 20 years. Yeah. So you mean, and I'm just saying, I'm being conservative because that the further you go along, the higher the price is going to go. So we're going to probably start at four to six million per year. But at some point in time, then you're 
eight to twelve, that might be nine to ten million. Okay, so if you're Romo, what do you do right now? You take that job? Skip. You're a competitor. But you, you, the, you got the but, fire in your soul. But for me, Skip, I had nothing to prove. Tony Romo winning a championship okay, changes but, how you perceive him. Okay, but put yourself in those shoes then. If Shannon Sharp is in those shoes and you haven't had the opportunity. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm gone. You're, I'm gone. I'm okay, retired. but you're, you're doing the hypothetical that you already had three rings. No. Oh, no. No. Because, really? Skip, there's no guarantee. If I can't think about it, Skip. You got to, at least if he had gone to a championship game, if he had gone to and lost a Super Bowl, he says, you know what? I've been there before. I can look at this team. I'm the missing piece. But you're talking about going to uncharted waters. Skip, I'm not, but 19 million for one year, that's what he's going to make. But he's not going to get that. Even if they trade, they're going to redo that contract they would, because they're not going to have a $25 million cap here. Actually, it's 24.7, but they're not going to have that. So you're going to do something around probably 8 to 12 million with every game that you're active is probably another 250 to 500,000. Skip, okay. I'm gone. So what if? And Jerry said this could go on for quote unquote months. So the stare down is going to go. The game of blink is going to go on and on and on. What if in the next six, eight weeks, finally Jerry comes to you and says, okay, I'm giving up here. I, I, you're going to be my starting quarterback next year. I don't want you to take the CBS job. Let's say it's D Day with CBS. Mm -hmm. You have to commit or don't. Right. What would you do then if, if he said, I, I've got a Super Bowl team here for you, and I want you to be my starting quarterback for as long as you can last physically this coming season? I'm gone. You're still gone. I'm gone. Because I, because I know that's not what Jerry wants. Jerry wants to control the situation. Jerry doesn't want me to leave. I know he doesn't want me to be a starter. He's just saying that because well, you I could not know that. Skip, he could have said that earlier. Why, why, why are you trying to trade him? If you, if you wanted to be your starter, why are you trying to trade him? Why would you not have reinserted him? But here's the thing that's going to happen, Skip. If he waits, if Tony Romo doesn't take e either one of these jobs, and he waits to right before training camp, that relationship will be irreparably harmed. I promise you that. If you wait till the beginning of training camp and you release him and you didn't give him an opportunity to go hit the free agent market and find a team and go through OTAs and throw – Skip, that relationship would be irreparably harmed. Now, I know everybody... He, I don't think Jerry cares. You, maybe yeah. you're right. Because cause think about it. He, re, he was going to release Michael Irvin. He was going to release mm -hmm. Troy Aikman. He, he uh, uh, released Emmitt Smith. Every, he, he released Jimmy Johnson. And every one of those... <laughs> skip. And when those guys went into the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. who spoke on their behalf? Okay. But maybe fences would get mended. Skip. Feelings By hurt, that time, fences yeah. mended. We, I mean, it's very easy for us to talk about, but, I mean, you know, facing your sports mortality is one of the yes, hardest things to is. do to accept that you can't play anymore. But here's the thing, though. Most guys, I mean, guys that hang on, Michael Jordan came back for the well, love of the game. Because he thought most of them don't have an option like being the league guy on right. CBS, sure. But that, still, I mean, you're, you're, we're talking very rationally here. This is an emotional and, and decision. you say Michael Jordan, he had six rings. So, yeah. So, okay. so, he, had, so he knew what it took yes. to get back. There's no guarantee. Mm -mm. Tony's never been. You're talking about going to. There's a lot of court. emotion and relationships mixed into this mm -hmm. situation. It's not just. It's not that simple. It's not hey, black and white. You get too old to play football. You don't get too old to talk. No mercy. Pete Carroll said yesterday that teams have called the Seahawks about a trade for four-time Pro Bowler Richard Sherman. Carroll added that there have been talks, but he doesn't see anything happening. Sherman had at least two incidents of calling out his coaches, including Pete Carroll, last year. Yesterday, Carroll talked about Sherman's challenging season. He said Richard went through a lot last year, most of it self-inflicted. He got out there, and he was in the midst of a season that was really challenging for him. If you remember when he did have his issue, it was right in the midst of playing some great players week after week after week. He was teed up for it and jacked up about it and all that, and he was competing like crazy. He was a fantastic battler. The only thing that happened is he just didn't come back to us. He didn't reset as he has. He's always found his way to reset. He kind of stayed on the edge throughout the season, which was very challenging for him to carry. Joined by Chris Carter. Chris, how will this all play out with Sherman? Oh, very interesting. Good insight. Great scouting report by Pete. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing that we should convey from Pete and the program they run in Seattle, that it is a necessity to have players like Richard Sherman 
Marshawn Lynch because they can interpret for the coaches the type of program, the type of practices, and the type of intensity that Pete teaches. And there's only a few coaches in the league that teach the way Pete does. Yes. And Pete's – one of the best things about Pete as a coach is he tries to make each individual player the best individual that they could be. So he felt like last year I couldn't do that with Richard. And typically Richard has the ability to be able to reset mentally and physically. So Pete was saying that last year during the season – I couldn't utilize Richard as a leader. Matter of fact, he was more, um, we were in personal battles with him because he was attacking not only my players, but the coaching staff. And I'm not going to be able to tolerate that. So it was a it was a hard season for Richard, personally in, inflicted. That's what he said. I think that's the most indicting thing in, in the whole statement. So they let Marshawn Lynch retire. People say, well, he retired. No. If they would have made certain accommodations to Marshawn, he would still be playing. And that's why he wants to still play with Oakland because he didn't get it out of his system. So I'm not surprised by this. But Pete knows what type of player that he needs. And he also needs veteran players that set great examples for the younger players of what he will tolerate. And when you have players criticizing the coaching staff on a weekly basis. So for me, Rich, be careful, man. Like, be careful. You had a great thing there in Seattle. The, your personality fits in perfect there. The Legion of Boom, the fans, the Super Bowls. Like, you got a great resume. Don't think that all that transfers to the other 31 teams because I think you'd be sadly mistaken. Mm. There was somebody that played a long time that foretold of these stories to, to be told. Mm. I told you what was going to happen. Coaches don't mind being outspoken, but you can't be disrespectful. You can't go to the head coach and tell him you will not run that play again. You will not give up our sacrifices. And not only tell him that to his face, because maybe if you tell that to his face, we can play it off. Oh, so we were having a discussion. But when well, by you... By the way, that's in the middle of a game. In the yeah, middle yeah. of a game. Right. In the middle of a game. Right. Pete could have handled behind closed doors. Yes. Then you, you feel so emboldened. You feel so secure in your place in that organization. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to tell the media, even though they didn't ask what was specifically said, I'm going to tell you, I told... It's like, hold on. Did you, he said, no, I told him just like that. I say, you will not run that play again. You will not give up our sacrifice. Sacrifice our hard work. I'm like, where do they do that at? And a part of this is Pete's problem because Pete has let these guys become so outspoken. Mm -hmm. and Right on the edge. He let them live right sometimes on the edge. Sometimes, I was a guy, Skip, I like going to the edge. I would look over the edge. I'm not going to put my toe over. I'm not going to try to see how much of my body I can get over. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look over the edge. I knew what my coaches would tolerate. But for me to question the coach's authority publicly, mm -hmm. if I had a problem, maybe I'd go to the coach and say, you know, I think in that situation, we'd have been better served to run the ball to TD. Or I think we should have ran the ball to Jamal Lewis. Mm -hmm. But to go public says, Mike Shanahan, you will next year. We lost in the first round. You will give Terrell Davis 25 carries. Mm -hmm. You will not sacrifice our 13-3 and record and our hard work by running some foolishness. Mm. Huh? You let the phys family business out of it. Skip. But here's the problem they're going to run into. And it's the same problem that Malcolm Butler's having. And you see the Saints says, you would have to give up compensation and you would have to take on that $11.3 million salary. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm a team, especially playing Dallas, mm -hmm. If the 28th player in the draft that you get, is he better than a 29? Richard Sherman just turned 29 today. Is he better than Richard Sherman? No. So this is what I would do. I would put a couple of years on that, put that $11.3 million base salary into a signing bonus <laughs> so I can make it easily easier to digest. Mm -hmm. I would trade for Richard Sherman. I would give up a late first or second round pick for him. But I keep telling him what I tell all players, just because you're valuable in one location doesn't mean you're going to be valuable in every location. I got it.
Well, that's, and that's your point. Be careful. Yep. Okay. I told you a month or so ago, sitting right here in this chair, that I would trade that 28th overall pick straight up for Richard Sherman because he still played at a very high level. Four straight Pro Bowls. Okay. And I saw a stat the other day, and it's, it's hard to sort of quantify cornerback mm -hmm. play, but I mm -hmm. saw one that he ranked number one in the NFL in – Completions allowed per every 15. He allowed one every 15. That's what it was. And that's number one in the NFL. So he had, he had a really good year. Yeah. Except I didn't believe he was really available. And after these quotes yesterday, he is definitely available because this business got put in the street by the head coach. And the general manager is talking about it. He is. And, and it's at the owner's meeting where all the other owners. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah. The people that's buying Yes. But the key word to me, and you mentioned it, was reset. Richard could not reset last year. He used to step over the edge. Right. And then he could gather himself and say, well, wait whoa, a second, whoa. what am I doing? And I'll step back here, and I'll be a team player after that. Mm -hmm. I stepped over, but I'm, I'm back, and I'm good. Oh, I realized that yeah. was a little, yeah. that was okay. a little yeah. harsh. I shouldn't I have said it. that. I got it. <laughs> but he didn't get it last year. He, he stepped two feet over the edge. You, you would peer over. Yeah. He would put two feet over, and then he would stay over for the rest of the game. And start walking. And, and it – it doesn't fly with the head coach and the GM. So is he available? I, I'm going to guess he is. And to your point, would he be that guy? Would he be a different guy? Could he play at that level in Rod Marinelli's, you know, sort of cover two Tampa scheme? I, I don't. Yeah, I think he could be because I'm desperate over here as a Cowboy fan because I think we have gotten worse. And mm -hmm. Jerry keeps saying, Stephen Jones keeps saying, we have a plan. There is method to our madness. And I'm saying, what, what method? Because <laughs> I don't see it. I, I don't seriously, but you need a player. You you need a quality player. So you need a star on defense to go with your your three quarters yeah. of a star who is Sean yeah. Lee. How, do, how are they gonna stop the Giants? Brandon Marshall, Odell. Right. How, how are they gonna stop them? With know. Shepard in the slot. <laughs> well, we had Orlando Scandrick in. Okay, he only he, he can't he guard him. On his he shoulder. can't guard three. He said, I'll play outside, okay? okay. But, but here's Y'all had me out of that segment on yeah. purpose. But. <laughs> CC, let me ask you this, CC. CC, let me ask you this. What do you think the chances are somebody called the Atlanta Falcons and asked, is Julio Jones available? Or they called the Houston Texans, is J.J. Watt available? Right. Ain't no teams called to acquire. You called them and put that out there. Mm -hmm. You let it be known you did. that Richard Sherman's available. Available. You, I tell you what, if somebody called the Broncos, what you think the chances are they ask, is Von Miller available? What about a key to leave? What about Chris Harris Jr.? But if you put that call out there, these guys, mm -hmm. that's what happened. And when, you know, he started bouncing on the sideline against Atlanta and they tried to calm him down, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And then it was one thing after another. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, the tolerance in your production, if that production is not way higher than the tolerance, guess which one got to go? There's also a surprise that Richard Sherman would be available and Pete Carroll doubled down on it by letting the information out. He did. Because all he had to do was talk no. behind the scenes. Like if he was trying to, but what he did was he got more people interested that, wow, Richard Sherman might be available. Really? And John Snyder, hey, yeah, he's available. Skip, you can be outspoken. There's a lot of guys that's, that's outspoken. But what a coach won't tolerate is you being openly and blatantly disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Now, you might say some things behind closed doors, and then a day later you come back like, you know, Coach, I was wrong in that situation. I apologize. But how do you come back from that? It's like when you was a kid, CC. there are certain things you could do at home, and Mom might let it slide. But try that at the grocery store at church. <laughs> okay. Wherever you get, wherever you, she told my brother, boy, wherever y'all show out, you're going to get woe out. Well said. So bottom line for me, I've had my personal issues with one Richard Sherman, but, you but I want him on my team because he can still play. Oh, yeah, he can still play. Yeah, no question. Oh, he'd be well, very he, good he, on that. He won't be the mouthpiece in Dallas because no. we know who that is. Uh, so. No mercy. You have set his bar high at the next level. Yes, you have to. There are a lot of players who are going to say, can't wait for my first shot at this young man, yes. right? And, and here's the thing, too. Take your first shot at him, but you don't think he's coming back? You out of your mind because, like I said, he was the best high school player. He became the best college player. He's not going to get to the pros where he's 100% in and all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm cool being average. He wants the top spot, and that's why I told him to be chasing Michael Jordan since okay. he was a baby. Lonnie, you don't have to wait till he gets cool to the league. you with that target that he painted on your back? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Uh, he's been like this my whole life. I tell everybody that, so it's nothing new to me.
That was LeVar and Lonzo Ball here on Undisputed yesterday. We're joined now Rob Parker. Welcome, Rob. What's happening? How you guys oh, doing? Yeah. Detroit. What's that's up? A, that's a new one, huh? Huh? You know, hanging in there. He lost weight. He stayed down to 192. That's Skip. Just hanging on you. You've lost all your... your... Birth, right? <laughs> hey, you see, drawing huh? up like wet like polyester. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I feel great. You look good, Rob. Thank you. What was your reaction to the interview? I, real quick, the saying that he's chasing Jordan, was that a slight of LeBron? Did you take it that way or no? Or I just a debt? I thought that was obvious. I mean, oh, okay. Did you take who, that? Who wouldn't you chase? No, but Stop, skip. Well, I'm, no, I'm just asking from, from, the, from Lonzo's, he's 19, so it's more about LeBron than saying Michael Jordan. Right. So I was just surprised when his dad said, chase Michael Jordan. That's all. Well, Jordan, okay. Jordan has more rings. And... Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying. I don't have any issue with it, but I was greatest. just curious about it. Uh, and, and Lonzo, I think he is an unaffected young man by his dad. I mean, I, I think this is his dad. A lot of people think this is just some marketing campaign of the last month. I don't buy it. This is who the man is, LeVar. And he's probably been through it, heard it all, sat at the breakfast table. He even said uh, at some point about playing his dad, and he goes, I wouldn't play him. He cheats. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Great. And I thought that was like that a little insight. Yeah. So he kind of knows who his dad is. He accepts his dad. His dad's a good dad. Any dad who can get three kids full rides to college is doing something right. Right. Regardless of the other stuff. But when it comes to the other thing, and you asked about players coming at him, it all, you know how the league works. You get respect when they know you can play. Once you get out there, and they're going to come at you anyway yeah. because you were a top pick yeah. or you're making money. So whether his dad said anything or not, they're going to say, I want to see if this kid can play. Yep. I'm going to challenge him. I'm going to do whatever. And he has to be able to respond to that. And I think he has a chance to be a real star because he's chilled, laid back, and he can play. And if he can take that to the next level... I don't see his dad interfering, derailing anything this kid can do. I was, I've always said this. I have no problem. I'm not in the business of telling someone how they should or shouldn't raise their kids. Um, he's a guy that's very proud of the job that he and his wife have done raising those young mm -hmm. men. They he's are. very proud. Um, he's a And he should be. He's a, mm -hmm. And when you listen to him talk, he's a proud father. And he's very proud. He's very excited that... My boys, my sons, my kids mm -hmm. are going to do this. And it's almost like he's trying to speak it into existence. You know, sometimes yeah, you, you, you talk about yeah. it enough, it's going to happen. Yep. Skip, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with him trying to, you know, you say he's trying to sell his boys or whatever. Um, I had a problem with I, I felt that he could have made his point about his son being able to be good without bringing LeBron or other superstar kids into the mix. Mm -hmm. That's the only problem. I love him. I love everything about him. My grandmother was never boastful around us, but I know she was very proud of what my brother and my sister, even though my sister wasn't a professional athlete, mm -hmm. I knew she was very proud because people would always come back and tell me, Mary, proud of you boys. Mm -hmm. So although it, there was no camera, no social media going on and on, I knew she was proud of what we accomplished. He's a proud of his son. Mm -hmm. Son won the state championship, and he's been, you know, trying to, to get his boys to do the right thing. So instead of, you know, looking down upon him, I commend him for the job that he and his wife has done. He got one son in college. He has another one on the way. Yep. Lonzo's about to go to the NBA. Hopefully, Melo can pass along. I just look at him as being a, a proud father. And other than, like I said, mentioning the, uh, the superstar kids, nothing he says has really upset me. Hmm. I know he rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And I know he has shaken up a whole lot of parents. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't treat your kids that way. You're putting too much pressure on your kids. You're trying to ride their coattails, blah, blah, blah. And every time I'm around him, the more I'm around him, the more the I more like him. You do. And you I can't, can't help, help it. it. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Turn the word right but on I my do mouth. because he is fearlessly, defiantly supportive of his number one son. Yes. He sat right here, and he, he the, the son... Cringes occasionally, but he still loves his dad. He you loves his tell. he loves you his dad. Tell. I totally you know? agree with and, that. And his son is the flip side of the dad. And I don't know the mom. God bless her. She's going through a health issue, but he's it, probably I, more I think, like the mom. I think he right? got his mom's nature. Yes. I'm just guessing that yes. because he's the flip side. He's unselfish to a fault. He doesn't even like to speak on TV. He was uncomfortable here with us. Like, do I have to speak? Yeah. You know, I'd ask him questions, and he'd be like, eh, I don't want to really. Right. It's not that's not his nature. 
If there's going to be a family reality show, he probably doesn't want to have a whole lot to do with no. it. Maybe this guy, yes. Oh, yeah. So far, okay? So, in the end, I, I criticized him for going after that coach at Chino Hills, and you right. went to the playoff game. I went to that game, right. Your younger son's lost. And, and he just excoriated him publicly. But then he explained, I, I basically raised him. He right. came and ate at our house. You know, right. I, I fed him. Because he, he hand said, picked him to be he hand picked him. Right. But then I asked him, okay, are you going to have input strategically at, at whatever pro team? You know, yeah. are you going to tell that coach how to coach? Heck no, I'm not going to do that. I don't tell Steve Alford nothing. Right. Okay? So he's he's doing it the correct way. When he answers, it's hard to to refute what he's saying and, and or criticize or condemn right. what he's saying. So I, I I love the way he's doing this, and I'm it's like I feel like I have to apologize. You know, him. Skip, all things being equal, I think um, Lonzo would really prefer his father tone it down. Probably. But that's not his. That's not, he. Lonzo is an old school dad. And we know we had the old school dads and granddads. When the father talked, mm -hmm. the kids did not talk or they didn't challenge him. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he's like, man, I wish my dad wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. But I look at LeVar as a proud, proud dad. I, I, and I, he's so excited. I, I, that, agree, I agree with that. And I think, though, Lonzo is used to it. Like, yes. like, like I say, people think that this is something new. Oh, he's trying to sell T-shirts and the brand and all that. This is who he is. I bet you if you talk to anybody from his past, he's always been that guy. Mm -hmm. And probably when they were little, little boys, my boys are going to the NBA. And They're going to be the best players ever. I, I just see that. And, and you see how he always referred to them. That's old school talking. Because that's the way my grandfather referred, referred to my brother and I, mm -hmm. them boys, mm -hmm. my boys. Mm -hmm. He refers to them. Most people say, oh, my son, oh, uh, Lonzo, my boys. He's so excited, Skip, for what he and his wife were able to do. We got a son in the college on a full ride. It didn't cost us a thing. Yeah. Now his ultimate dream, his ultimate goal is getting to the NBA, and it's right there. Yep. Now I got the, the next boy. He's going to UCLA, and if everything goes according to plan, he will follow Lonzo into the NBA. And then the baby boy, mm -hmm. if everything goes according to plan, if he'll go to UCLA, and he'll follow the other two into that the NBA. That would be an amazing feat, yeah, to yeah. be well, honest, because I, I can't skip. you got to help me out with anybody who's um, got three sons Rick in the Rick NBA. Barry's Rick Barry's had, had three. three. They weren't at this, like, high draft. But think about it, Skip. You don't think Archie and Olivia Manning is proud of Peyton oh. and Eli? Oh, oh. Just it, it just because they don't they don't have you know they're not on television. I know because I I've talk, I love I love Archie. I love Olivia also. Now they're proud of their kids yeah. and what they've been able to come. Right, not to say that Lavar has a naturally polarizing nature. He does. He does. And he's funny. That's just. It's remember, just we asked him. him. So the coach, he told me the coach can't come to my house and get another meal. Well, you were, <laughs> said, you, were right you, to, you were right to criticize the high school thing because you are talking about kids, and there are <laughs> other kids on the team besides his kids. Uh, absolutely. That's an amateur level, and that's it a is. different. But, whole but different he polarizes. The reason is they're just people who don't like to hear parents like be that boastful. Yeah. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Right. right. It's, it's like, it's like okay, you can't like, play. You right. talk about Lonzo. You write the check. Lonzo got a cash. No mercy. Boston Herald is reporting the Patriots have taken former Oklahoma running back Joe Mixon off their draft board. At least three other teams have reportedly also taken him off their draft boards. Mixon has been at the center of controversy after a video surfaced of him hitting a woman back in 2014. Earlier this week, Mel Kuyper said Mixon was the most talented running back in the draft. We're joined by Joel Klatt. Welcome, Joel. Thank you. Good to be here. Joel, you ranked Mixon as the 49th best prospect a yeah. few weeks ago. Have you changed your ranking of Mixon at all? You know, if, if it were to change, the only thing that is making me change is talking with people around the NFL and realizing that this slide is going to continue uh, towards the back half of the draft. Certainly not what Mel Kuyper is talking about at the top of the draft. Um, and, and I would disagree with Mel completely about the best running back in the draft. He... Joe Mixon is a talented player. There, there's clear evidence of that, but he's not the best running back in the draft, even if you take the incidents out of question. Um, Christian McCaffrey is that player, but there are three very specific reasons, guys, that Joe Mixon is not going to get selected in the first round. And those involve football reasons, financial reasons, as well as public relations reasons. Football reasons I just talked about. He's not even the best running back available, maybe not even in the top three. When you're talking about guys like Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette, and Christian McCaffrey all in the same draft class. But by the way, throw in Alvin Kamara as well, who's a very talented player without the mileage on his tires that some of these other guys have. 
So there's the football reason. Then there's the financial reason. Skip, there is no reason. In fact, it would be fiscally irresponsible for a team to select him in the first round or pay full price for anything that they know is about to go on sale. All right? Demand right now is not keeping up. He's falling off of draft boards like the Boston Herald reported in New England. That's happening at several other places. In fact, I know of a report that eight owners have said they are not comfortable at all with drafting him in the first round. Now, only five of those eight said they were comfortable drafting, drafting him at all. So there's a fiscal component to this. You're going to lose money based on the value of Joe Mixon in this draft. And then comes the public relations nightmare of selecting uh, a man who violently assaulted a female on video. That's going to follow him, okay? And so the quickest way to be defeated in the sport of football is to be distracted. Shannon, you know that. Locker rooms that are distracted quickly are defeated. And this is going to be a distraction. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And distractions generally are the things that owners and teams stay away from vehemently. Look at what's going on with Colin Kaepernick or what happened with Tim Tebow. These are distractions that teams have moved away from for whatever reason. And the same will go for Joe Mixon as well. Well, I'm glad to see that the New England Patriots did not take Michael Floyd off their free agent board once he got that DUI. And they saw, the police officers saw three green, two green lights. And he was so drunk at the intersection that they had to tap on the glass to wake him up. So I'm glad all of a sudden they found a way to... But let me ask you this. How much of a distraction was Tyreek Hill? Because he went through a very similar thing. And I can assure you, a lot of the people that booed him, when they selected him, when he took that first kickoff back, Skip, how many of them thought that was the guy that did what he did? They applauded what he did. Remember that Sunday night game when he single-handedly beat the Broncos? He had a punt return, a kick return. A, no, he had a, uh, a punt return because it was a safety. Mm -hmm. Then he had a rushing touchdown, and yeah. then he caught the game, you know, game uh, uh, winning, uh, uh, yeah. getting the overtime. Special player. Yeah. So I think once he gets into the league, uh, and, and sure, they'll never forget this. This is on his resume. Um, but for me, I think he's fulfilled his obligations through the judicial system. The state of Oklahoma said for a, for a guy – a first-time offender with no priors, this is what we deem your punishment to be. Mm -hmm. He's fulfilled that. Oklahoma said he was the number one running back in the country. He was the top three player in all the country. Mm -hmm. They said our requirement requires you to miss everything Oklahoma-related, but you still got to go to class. Mm -hmm. For one for, oh, for one year. year. <clears throat> he did that. Mm -hmm. The NFL says, you know what, we hadn't had our crack at you just yet. But this is what we're going to do. We have an audition, a big audition, where we have about, about 350 guys. And all the teams and the general manager and the people that make the decision, that's a job interview. You can't come to this interview. But now, back at your school, Oklahoma, if you want to have your, you know, another interview session, they want to show up, have at it. I agree with you. I don't think he's the best running back. Because for my money, I think the best running back is Christian McCaffrey. But I think Leonard Fournette would be the first one chosen because I don't see how he gets past the Carolina Panthers. Sure. Considering what a they do. A great fit there. Yeah. Yes, yes, he does. Now, is he a first? I don't believe he – is. He does he go, say, one of the first 32 picks? It's hard for me to believe that he won't be somewhere in that next 32. Sure. So that's the thing. But there's two things that I've learned in my life about second chances. We all love second chances if we're the one receiving it. And second chances are okay if you don't get, get an opportunity to make millions along with that second chance. Because, see, this is the problem that people are having with Joe Mixon. Uh, yeah, he did. What he did was wrong. And I'm not trying to excuse wrong. what he did. It was horrendously wrong. Yep. But here's the thing, though, Skip. If Joe Mixon was getting a second chance and he was working at a job making $50,000 a year, people would be okay with that. Sure they would. But now Joe Mixon has an opportunity to not, not make $50,000. He has an opportunity to make $50,000 a game. He gets an opportunity to make millions. And therein lies the problem. We love second chances, Skip. Mm -hmm. Let me get one of those. Mm -hmm. So, back to the question. I'm going to say it one more time. In no way am I defending or condoning what Joe Mixon did to that woman as a freshman in his first week on campus at the University of Oklahoma. But to your point, he paid every price he was asked to pay. Mm -hmm. And by all accounts, he has nothing else on his record that would indicate 
he's a bad bet in the National Football Correct. League. I don't I don't know of any. Maybe there is that I don't know about. No, but I this heard is anything. one of the only this red flag. Oh, the uh, only red the flag only red for flag. Joe. Yeah. So is he zero tolerance from here on? You better believe he is. Yep. Yes. But does he deserve a chance to make it in the NFL? Do you believe he does? Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 make no bones about it. What I'm talking about is first round versus later in the okay. draft. I think he absolutely deserves a shot to go make a living at his chosen skill. Now, whether he gets selected where he's going to get those guaranteed millions versus where he falls to when he's making maybe 650000 guaranteed, that's the difference in what we're talking about okay. here. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, but I told you whenever it was a week or so ago, I think he's the most talented back in the draft. I'm with Mel Kuyper on this because I watched every snap he took at the University of Oklahoma because I'm a fan, but I'm not particularly a fan of Joe Mixon. I just kept sitting back game after night after game after night saying, hey, he's, he is really good. Mm. He's a little better all-around back than Christian McCaffrey. Huh? I love Christian McCaffrey. No, no. He's 20 pounds heavier. He can oh. slam it between the tackles. Christian McCaffrey will not be able to take the between the tackles pounding in the National He, does, he doesn't League. have to because of his versatility. Okay. It's that, luxury. That's, it's that's, luxury. Just where you're, okay. that's just where you're wrong. Every okay. aspect of the nope. sport nope. McCaffrey is better at. He's and a better runner between nope. the tackles, outside Who's the faster? tackles, and who, a better. Who ran the faster 40? We're not running okay. tracks, Skip. And, and, and this guy is 20 pounds heavier, and he's faster. I'm going to take this we guy. We don't get points for getting on the scale what? either. Even we get Christian points McCaffrey for making first downs and touchdowns. Okay. Christian McCaffrey is the, the equivalent of a very good wide receiver in the national foot, like a slot receiver. This guy can catch it like crazy. I just saw a clip that I'd forgotten about. It, he made a one-hand catch. He was catching 20 and 30-yard passes from Baker Mayfield down the field like a wide receiver. He's not Christian McCaffrey, but he can do that in the same ballpark that Christian McCaffrey can do, and he can do what a running back needs to do, which is slam it between the tackles and stay healthy because he did stay healthy. And by the way, he had a 97-yard kickoff return against Ohio State in a game that you attended. Yeah, and I'm not saying he's a bad player. There's, there's, He is a really good player and a talented player. There's no question about that. There is a difference in a running back catching the ball well out of the backfield and being – a great receiver of the football. Wouldn't you agree with that, Shannon? Totally agree. And McCaffrey is a great he receiver is. of the football. He's a great route runner. Mixon happens to catch it well for a running back. There is a stark difference okay. between the two. And like I said, McCaffrey, when you watch his film and you break it down, McCaffrey is a much more talented and instinctive runner, even between the mm -hmm. tackles. And his 20 pounds will affect him in the NFL. That's why his versatility is so important, speaking of McCaffrey. Mm -hmm. He can get to the 20 touches a game and take far less beating than Joe Mixon's going to have to or Leonard Fournette's mm -hmm. going to have to because of the way that he touches the ball and affects the game outside of the between the tackles. But, but Mixon teams. did do way more bench 225 than Chris, Christian McCaffrey. But the football weighs 15 ounces. Now, if he was carrying a bowling ball, I'll be concerned, George. They let that the football is a bowling ball. I'm like, man, 16 pound bowling ball late in the fourth quarter. Well, then why do they make them do that? I don't, I don't know. To see I how do. strong they are. Yep. <laughs> Skip can't do 225. No, I can't. But I can do a lot more than you think. I, I can, can tell if you, you right want now. To go to the gym with me after we finish today. Mm -hmm. I'll show you. I have okay? seen. If it's so on the way, players. if it's on the way to the airport. No, no. <laughs> okay. How so many players have you seen just weight room champions and they cannot play that, a that down? Is, that is correct. But I have been doing this for a long time, and I remind you, there's this thing that operates before every draft called the smoke screen. And when you say you read reports that eight teams have taken them off the draft board, <clears throat> baloney. Trust me, somebody's sitting there late in the first round, maybe even the middle of the first round, saying, I'm sitting on Joe Mixon, and I don't care what anybody thinks. We're going to take the PR beating because it would be for a while. But OU took a PR beating last year, and guess what? He played the whole year, and it was just fine. Nope, you, you sort of – you don't – Forgive, but you forget about it after a while when he starts scoring touchdowns. When, yeah, exactly. Life. They're not going to – oh, man. Yeah. He, you remember what he did? You remember what yeah. he did in college? Yeah, well, They're not thinking about not that. That's not how it works. Did you pay there. full price for a suit that was going on sale tomorrow? But how do you know it's going on Would sale? You? What, what if somebody else – What if that suit's not going to be there? Yeah, what if somebody else is going to buy it out from under you? No mercy. This is the Skip and Shannon Undisputed Podcast, where we're delivering you an unscripted, unfiltered, undisputed version of the biggest topics of the day show. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, like us on Facebook at Undisputed on FS1, follow on Twitter at Undisputed, and catch us at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 Pacific, Monday through Friday on FS1. You can find us on Channel 219 on DirecTV, 150 on Dish.
Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm your host, Joy Taylor. That's it for us today. A special programming note. We take a rare day off tomorrow, but we are back on Monday, so have a great weekend. And tomorrow is Friday. I'd love to see all your Dance Party Friday videos. I'm still going to do it, even though I'm off. So make sure you tweet me at Joy Taylor Talks and follow on Instagram and Snapchat so I can see all of your videos. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. Facts, sports, one of one.